Hello, my name is Ghinwa Hakim and you are watching the Arabic Hour. On today's program, we bring you coverage of Eyewitness Palestine, Moving to the Brink, a panel hosted by Students for Justice in Palestine, Boston University, and the Alliance for Water Justice in Palestine. The panel was held on March 7, 2019 at Boston University. Presenters were Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Hubert Murray, and Nancy Murray. They reported back from their recent trip to Palestine and described what they saw and heard in meetings with farmers, workers, refugees, Israeli refusers, and activists in the West Bank and Israel. And now, Eyewitness Palestine, moving to the brink. In November of last year, I co-led an Eyewitness Palestine delegation to the West Bank and Israel. And as uh, you heard, I've made many, many visits to Palestine since my first visit as part of a human rights fact-finding delegation in 1988, when the unarmed popular uprising of the entire Palestinian population, known as the Intifada, it wasn't the first Intifada, it was the Intifada, was nine months old. How different things are today. In 1988, the small human rights delegation I was part of moved around and between the West Bank and Gaza Strip that had not yet been forcibly separated from each other and carved up by walls. Israeli-only bypass roads and hundreds of permanent checkpoints were not yet fully in place. And it was still possible to drive the short distance from the West Bank through Israel to the Gaza Strip and the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza Strip could make common cause with each other. Israeli set settlers numbered a fraction of what they do today. But one thing is in unchanging, and that is the dehumanizing treatment of Palestinians by a brutal occupying force. More than 200,000 Palestinians would be arrested during the first intifada and more than 1,000 killed in spite of that, everywhere we went in 1988, we encountered hope. Palestinians were convinced that their unarmed struggle would succeed in ending Israel's occupation, which was 20 years old when the uprising began. And everywhere we went, we saw evidence of America's involvement from made in Pennsylvania tear gas canisters that caused at least 70 deaths and untold miscarriages during the course of the first intifada, to the made in California belly, billy clubs used to break demonstrators' bones. Now the magnitude, by the way, okay, I, I, uh, let's just go back for a second. So those of you who are familiar with the map, you will see in red the places we went on this second trip. So that's, these are the places you're going to hear about from myself and from Hubert in a few minutes. We went from the very south way up to the north, and I'll talk about some of that. Okay, so the magnitude of U.S. financial support for Israel over the years 137 billion is the figure given in a congressional research report in early 2018. And the supply of US made weapons to maintain the occupation have grown considerably since my first trip. Now this shows you, this is from the uh, US Campaign for Palestinian Rights website, and it shows how much Massachusetts taxpayers pay every year. You can go to this page, click on a state, and find your share of that 137 billion if you add it all up over the years. You'll see how much we have paid. This is just an annual figure, uh, annual figure 128.5 million is what we pay per year. And just think of what that could do here in Massachusetts. So our aid, military aid now, to Israel has grown over the years and so has Israel's illegal settlement em en enterprise. Back in 1988, parts of Jerusalem were flanked by settlements, but one could still drive considerable stretches in the West Bank without encountering them. 
Having observed the settlements multiply and expand over the last 20 years, I was still not fully prepared for the feverish surge in settlement construction and Israel only road networks, the building up of those road networks, which has been turning the West Bank into a kind of biblical theme park. This has noticeably accelerated since my last visit two years ago, no doubt due to the Trump factor. That's an example of the uh, carving up of the West Bank with the settler roads and the walls. For what we saw happening in the West Bank is going for broke Israeli colonization of Palestinian land and confiscation of Palestinian water resources all of which is illegal under international law. And in keeping with the nation state law that Israel adopted as a basic law, uh, which is, acts like a constitution, the basic law in Israel. So it adopted this nation state law last year it, in which it says promoting Jewish settlement is a national value. So that is what it is now doing. It is seeking to impose settlements across the West Bank, seeking to impose the map of Eretz Israel on Palestinian land. Eretz Israel is the greater Israel, is what it's called, the biblical Judea and Samaria, which is what religious settlers now call the West Bank and what they claim is a divine right. Um, this is an interesting slide. It's an Israeli organization, Levi Heolam. The slide website is called Explore Judea and Samaria. And it was set up, it says, to support local Jewish business owners in Judea and Samaria who are suffering because of the anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So when you click on these little hearts, those are illegal settlement businesses. So you can go find this website and look and see all of these businesses they say are suffering. <coughs> Hello, Mariama, welcome. They say are suffering because of the BDS movement. And, and this shows as well the extent of settlements. The blue dots are the settlements in the West Bank. You may be aware that Israel is an unusual state in that it has no fixed borders and it never committed itself to specific borders during the so-called Oslo peace process that began 25 years ago. Since Oslo, the number of settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem has tripled to 750,000. And in, on February 4th, the Israeli government announced its goal was to settle an additional one million settlers in the West Bank, a number that officials have since then upped to two million. So they really are going all out now to cover the West Bank with illegal settlements. Today, throughout the landlocked West Bank, Palestinians are corralled into small enclaves by walls, watchtowers, military checkpoints, a road system that bisects the land but is off limits to them, closed military zones, and omnipresent fortress-like settlements that glower over the rural landscape. On many roads, new signage points the way to settlements but omits references to Palestinian villages and towns that remain an obstacle to the full realization of the Eretz Israel vision and large red signs tell Israelis that their lives would be in danger if they stray into these towns. Can you see what that says? It basically says this, uh, this road leads to an area under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden, dangerous to your lives and is against Israeli law. And you know, when Israelis actually do go in, they find they're welcomed in, in many cases if they go in with, you know, because they really want to understand what's happening. Uh, that sign is to really strike fear into the Israeli population. Most West Bank Palestinians can no longer enter East Jerusalem 
which contains the third holiest site in Islam and used to be the vibrant educational, artistic, medical, and economic center of Palestinian life. All that has been destroyed by the wall that is snaking around and through East Jerusalem. When I first visited the old city of Jerusalem, the main gate to the Palestinian East Jerusalem, Damascus Gate, was this is the old city's main gate, was teeming with life. It was where market women from surrounding villages sold their garden produce. The entrance is now nearly empty and sanitized as the apartheid wall has sealed off East Jerusalem from nearby fields and villages, depriving farmers of the ability to access what used to be their economic beating heart. So here though, as this happened just in the last year, the apparatus of dispossession is tastefully displayed. You don't see those huge towers that you saw on the previous slide. Instead, for the sensibilities of tourists, you see this rather more modest tower and there are two nice stone little army encampments near the old city gate. So Israeli soldiers with their weapons and high-tech equipment are now clustered in these stone encampments and one discreet mini tower, which, as I said, was just erected. They attract little attention from tourists who pose and take their selfies with the Damascus Gate as a background. All around us were signs of what Palestinians call the ongoing Nakba, with the Palestinian presence being diminished, if not erased altogether, through a variety of means, such as home demolitions. Some 44,000 houses in the West Bank and East Jerusalem have demolition orders, and they can be destroyed at any time. And uh, 27,000 have already been destroyed since 1967. So they're living in this feeling of, you know, real insecurity. So that's one, home demolitions, the revocation of permits to live in Jerusalem. 15,000 Palestinians have had their permits revoked since 1967. And 35% of Palestinian privately owned land in Jerusalem has been confiscated to build settlements or to create national parks. So East Jerusalem is really changing. It's so dramatic since, you know, the, over the 30 years I have been going. As we drove around the outskirts of Jerusalem with the organization Grassroots Al-Quds, we saw where the U.S. plans to build its new embassy, which happens to be adjacent to an Israeli settlement. And we stopped at an <coughs> overlook. Here's the overlook. Uh, where we could see the settler highway running through what is called E1 to the major settlement city of Ma'ale Adumim. Now E1, which you see here, this is all the only opening that now connects the north of the West Bank with the south of the West Bank. And Israel intends to basically get rid of the Bedouin who live there and expand the settlement so Jerusalem will be continuous to Ma'alea Dumim and then you're in the Jordan Valley. In other words, cutting the West Bank in two. Um, we see on the next slide here, uh, this has been in the news quite a bit, Khan al-Ahmar, which is a Bedouin encampment, which they're trying to get rid of. There's been a lot of international outcry about it because people realize this is all that's keeping the West Bank from being chopped into. That is sewage that settlers had dropped, well, had flushed through the village. This is one of the things they do. Um, and that's not a nice little, you know, clean stream. Okay, I should point out that it is not just the stateless Palestinians of the West Bank who face expulsion from their land. We visited a Bedouin community in the Negev Desert, part of Israel. This is a place called Al-Arakib. These are Israeli citizens. And Al-Arakib is one of 45 what are called unrecognized villages, which have been there long before the state of Israel was formed, but have no water, no schools, no electricity, and do not appear on maps. 
Now Israel wants to remove them so it can what they call Judaize the area. And Sheikh Aziz Al-Tur told us his ancestors have been here for 500 years. He showed us Ottoman register documents to prove this is their land. Al-Araki, astonishingly, has been destroyed by the Israeli army 130 times since 1998. And the Jewish National Fund has planted water greedy but swiftly growing eucalyptus trees in the desert so they could no longer use their land to graze their animals. Um, and when uh, we were there, some of us in this room visited before when the trees were small, now they're quite high and they get watered. A similar dispossession agenda is playing out throughout the villages of the 61% of the West Bank known since Oslo as Area C. This is home to 300,000 people. So it's playing out there. It's also playing out in the largest city in the West Bank, Hebron, where some 1,000 settlers are now implanted in the heart of the old city, turning it into a ghost town. And these settlers are particularly aggressive towards Palestinians. Um, just to make the point, the grave of Baruch Goldstein, who is a Brooklyn-born settler from Kiryat Arba, which overlooks Hebron, is a place of pilgrimage. Why? Because in November 2004, he entered Hebron's holy site, the Ibrahimi Mosque, and shot dead 29 Muslims at prayer and wounded more than 100. So he is a hero to the settlers of in, inside Hebron and on the Kiryat Arba, which overlooks the city. Since 1997, a multinational observer force known as the Temporary International Presence in Hebron, or TIPF, had been monitoring said settler attacks on Palestinians in the old part of Hebron. But last month, following the leak of a confidential TIPF report detailing 40,000 separate cases of abuse, Prime Minister Netanyahu ordered the TIPF out of the country. And in the UN, the US blocked a draft Security Council resolution expressing regret at the expulsion of the monitors. The settlers now have the green light to complete their violent colonization of old Hebron. Palestine used to be rich in agriculture, but thanks to the various means that are being employed to impoverish Palestinian farmers and drive them from the land, today agriculture accounts for only 3% of the West Bank GDP. <coughs> and let me cite a few of these means. Settlers frequently vandalize Palestinian homes and olive groves and attack farmers in their fields, often as Israeli soldiers stand by. The destruction of olive trees and fruit orchards deprives many Palestinian families of their only source of income, eventually forcing them to leave their land. Thousands of Palestinian farmers have lost their livelihoods to the $3 billion separation wall, I think, you, do we have a slide, that cuts deeply into the West Bank. Many have denied, been denied so-called visitor permits to pass through the lock gates to access their fields and sources of water that lie beyond the wall. Some have permits, but the locked gates are never opened. And if land is uncultivated for three years, it is considered neglected land which can be seized by the state. So that's another means of getting rid of farmers. But the major method Israel has employed to destroy Palestinian agriculture is the weaponization of water. Since 1967, Israel has taken control of the West Bank aquifers and forced Palestinian to buy back their own water. Israel's, Israelis use, by the way, five to six times as much water as Palestinians and 10 times more than refugee camp residents. I don't know if you can read this, but um, I'll keep talking while it stays. So Palestinians' access to water is well beneath the minimum standards set by the World Health Organization, and for weeks at a time, water taps in villages and refugee camps run dry, 
while West Bank settlers routinely enjoy green lawns and swimming pools. In addition, Israel destroys Palestinian wells, cisterns, irrigation and sewer systems, sewage systems, and prevents rebuilding. In fact, in this month, they have destroyed, gone on a real destruction binge in both the north of the West Bank, the south of the West Bank, and in the Jordan Valley, depriving thousands and thousands of villagers of water. Farmers are often prevented from storing harvested rainwater and cannot afford to irrigate their fields by purchasing at the high rates the water that the Israeli national water carrier called Mekorot has stolen from the West Bank. Now practically everywhere we travel to in the West Bank we heard about a water crisis that has forced farmers off their land and the picture is particularly stark in the Jordan Valley which was once the West Bank's breadbasket. Now much of it has been sucked nearly dry by the 12 major Israeli wells and Mekorot pumping stations supplying Israeli settlement greenhouses and farms. Most of the Palestinian communities in the Jordan Valley have been declared part of Area C where building of any kind is forbidden and many existing structures have demolition orders. We visited the site of what had been a major Palestinian water source, the al Wujaf Spring. This is again in the Jordan Valley. So plentiful was its volume of water, you could see signs of when it used to cascade down the hill. Uh, we were told that people would come from elsewhere in the West Bank to gaze on the waterfalls carved into the arid landscape and have picnics on the banks of its mighty stream. Now no water can be seen and the spring is totally dry. Nearby Israeli settlements and greenhouses are served by a Mekorot pumping station, that little blue thing there, that pumps 2,000 cubic meters of water per hour from a depth of over 1,000 meters. Palestinians in the Jordan Valley, including in the city of Jericho, are forced to buy their water back from Mekorot at a rate six times higher than the amount Israelis pay. Now this pumping station may look fairly insignificant, but it is a fact, in fact, an engine of Palestinian dispossession and environmental devastation. It has increased the desertification of land, made it impossible for the Bedouin in the region to keep their flocks fed, and watered and killed once flourishing agriculture on Palestinian farms. And sooner or later, Israeli farms too are bound to become unsustainable as Mekorot pumps the West Bank aquifer dry. So what happens when farmers can no longer get li their livelihood from the land? Now some 120,000 Palestinians, mostly with work permits, assemble at 3 a.m at transit stations like this one, which we visited in Tilkarum, where they go through this dehumanizing cattle grid, or cattle pen more like, and endure having their fingerprints taken on a daily basis, irises scanned, and sometimes their entire skeleton scanned, so they can do the dirty and dangerous jobs in Israel and carry out settlement construction. We witnessed, just in the hours we were there, reportedly 20,000 workers passing through this terminal. There are five others like it. We were told it could take up to seven hours to reach a job in Israel. So once they get there at three or four in the morning, by the time they reach their jobs, it could be seven hours later. After working all day, they pass back through the cage on their return journey around 7 a.m. and many spend hours then going home. Others who don't have permits cannot go through the terminals, but we were told, enter Israel by climbing over the wall. Now, as bad as all this is, the situation in the Gaza Strip is even worse. And you may know for a dozen years, the tiny Gaza Strip, 70% of them re are refugees, it has been a closed prison. So we could not enter Gaza. But the last time I did was in 2016, and it took me six months to get through the permitting process. 
We couldn't go there, but we did Skype with a young Gazan, Rawan Yagi. This is Rawan. And after talking with her, some members of our group were in tears. We could mainly, maybe talk later about the situation during the Q&A in Gaza. But what I want to leave you with now is the fact that the UN has reported that the Gaza Strip will be unlivable by 2020, if it isn't already, and that 98% of its water is not fit to drink. This is a very tiny area, only 26 miles long and four or five miles wide, where Israel has conducted five major military offenses since 2008, killing thousands of people, 800 of them children, and destroying homes, schools, hospitals, and the vital infrastructure for water, sewage, and electricity. And after each aggression, the Israeli-imposed closure has remained in place, blocking the import of much essential building material and forcing many people to live amid raw sewage and often in the rubble of their homes. Now, how many of you know of the Great March of Return? Yes, you've been watching it. Are you aware that it's still ongoing? It will soon be a year old on March 30th. Recently, some of us were fortunate to hear and meet Ahmed Abu Artema, who spoke at Harvard Law School. He is the organizer of the Great March. Um, and he gave us a very clear picture of why the Great March was started. And again, we could talk about that in Q&A. Um, in the early days of the Great March, it reminded me so much of the spirited, unarmed civil uprising involving women, men, and children I had first encountered in the Gaza Strip in 1988, for that is where the First Intifada began, on December 7, 1987. And in the years since then, it can be argued that Israel has been using the Gaza Strip as a kind of laboratory for field testing its new weapon systems and finding the breaking point of human beings. So terrible are conditions there that now uh, that the Israeli historian Ilan Pape in his book, The World's Biggest Prison, has called what is going on in the Gaza Strip incremental genocide. Um, you might have remember um, uh, Rahwan uh, El Najjar, who was killed. She was a medic, and she was killed while she was trying to save other people. And these are some of the recent images. Let me conclude by saying that this isolation of the West Bank from the Gaza Strip, of one part of the West Bank from another, of one town from another, and of just about all West Bankers from the residents of East Jerusalem, this is a powerful deterrent to the kind of unified civil uprising of the entire society that I witnessed when I first traveled to the occupied territories in 1988. And you can get a sense of what that was like on March 26, the movie Nyla and the Uprising is going to be on PBS at 9 o'clock. So I strongly urge you to watch it. So it's different, but this does not mean there is no hope. On the contrary, Palestinians are still resisting and refusing to be dehumanized and defeated, as Hubert will explain. Thank you, Nancy. And, um, and also to welcome my architectural and environmental and urbanist friends who are not the usual choir. So it's really great to see you here. Um, I'm just going to remind you with this map and the next one of where we went so you can sort of Im image Ramallah, Jericho, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, and Nablus far in the north, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, where, we, where we're going as we um, go through this. Um, I'm going to introduce you to many of the people to whom we were in, w to whom we were introduced during our two weeks in the West Bank, and these are people who are not just surviving in the difficult circumstances that Nancy's described, but they're persisting and prevailing against horrendous odds, and resisting. And I'm going to categorize these in there are three bunches: there's agricultural resistance, cultural resistance, and political resistance. So to start with agricultural resistance. The Tent of Nations 
is a small family farm just a few kilometers from Bethlehem, located in Area C, which is 60% of the West Bank that is under the direct control of Israel. The Israeli strategy is to clear these areas of Palestinian inhabitants, as Nancy has been describing, achieving this goal incrementally by refusing building permits for any structure. 99% of permits have been rejected. Disallowing any natural water harvesting systems, e.g. collecting rainwater from a roof, and allowing the surrounding settlers to cut down olive trees and fruit trees and block access roads. All this and more has been endured by the Nassau family on their farm, encircled now by approximately 60,000 settlers. Despite the families having clear legal title to the land, with documentation reaching back to Ottoman and British rule, the Israeli government is conducting a long drawn out and costly legal battle in the hope that the family will give up and leave. The Nassau family is not only fighting the government in court, they are determinedly farming, farming their olives and almonds with support from volunteers refusing to give in. Turning down blank check offers, they say their mother, the land that has nurtured them, is not for sale. As brothers Daoud and Daher each told us, they encourage visits by international volunteers to work on the farm since that has proven to be the most effective human shield against attacks by the settlers. Because they're not allowed to build, they live and work in a series of eight caves, one of which you see here on the bottom, um, and a handful of surface structures that may be physically or legally attacked. Their strategy is encapsulated, cast in stone, with the dictum, we refuse to be enemies. That you might just be able to read that on the top right corner. Daher explained that if a person starts to hate the people who are uprooting your trees, burning other trees and crops, that hatred can easily consume your life and being. And to quote, with hatred, we will destroy ourselves. North of Ramallah is the village of Bilin, also in Area C. Bilin may be known to some of you through the film Five Broken Cameras. The curious title refers to cameras used to record the regular Friday peaceful protests against the occupation and the apartheid war, cameras successfully broken by the IDF. After 14 years of Friday demonstrations organized and led by the Bernat family, they are now up to something like 20 broken cameras. The dirt road approach to the Yom Sleiman farm is littered with tear gas canisters, which you see in a little in inset there. Um, and an 8 meter high, 26 foot concrete wall leading to the farm itself, faced on the other side by the vast and illegal Modin Elite Settlement, a dense European style conurbation of more than 45,000 inhabitants, which you can see in the, in the background over there. The Young Sleiman farm is a CSA. Who knows what a CSA is? Community Supported Agriculture. It's an initiative started by Muhab al Alami in 2016. The land was initially annexed by Israel's occupation wall, but after a series of weekly demonstrations on the ground and backed up by international pressure in 1997, Israel had to back off about, nine, about 50 percent of that land, which was restored to its owners in 2007. One of those owners donated his restored land to the startup enterprise. The economic model is that consumers collectively invest in the crops raised and managed by Muhab and his colleague Mohammed Abu Jayab. They now have 30 participating families, 50 raised beds under cultivation, with a wide range of fruits and veg. The farm lives under constant threat of demolition, and there are 44 demolition orders in Bilin alone. But Muhab, Muhab takes the view that food self-sufficiency is an important part of the resistance to the occupation. In his words, we are here and won't give up. We are prepared to pay the price for freedom. Not widely publicized is the prohibition of fertilizers on Palestinian land on the grounds that it could be used for explosives. A beneficial result of this is that many Palestinian farms have res resorted to true organic farming and in that sense are ahead of many of their European competitors in the production of organic olives, figs and nuts. Now I'm going to turn to cultural resistance. In 
1948, the Nakba caused 750,000 Palestinians to be made refugees, 100,000 permanently displaced within what is now, now called Israel. More than 600 Palestinian fam uh, villages were destroyed, not only physically, but erased from memory with a changing of names from Arabic to Hebrew and the ruins planted with trees to conceal the past. The Palestinian town of Lifta, which you see here, is just outside Jerusalem and it was one of the few not actually demolished but evacuated of its Palestinian families. The name has been Hebraized to May Naftor, what was once home to hundreds of reasonably prosperous Palestinian families is now a ghost town. A ruin surrounded by high density Israeli urbanization officially proclaimed a nature reserve and now gradually being repossessed by Orthodox Jewish Israelis who use the ancient spring as a bathing hole. Throughout Palestine, hundreds of villages have been destroyed, their inhabitants dispersed and place names changed, a technique used by colonists as a means of fully taking possession. Anybody who's seen Brian Friel's translations know how the British did that in Ireland. Now, this fellow you see on the left here is Umar al-Kubari, and he's one of the founders of Zohrot, an Israeli organization dedicated to resisting this erasure of memory and place through mapping the hundreds of destroyed villages, as well as maintaining historical records, written and oral, and as Umar has written, has written, quote, signs serve as a means of occupation, oppression, and erasure. He's sort of pointing this out on the sign here. Palestinians come upon these signs and they feel helpless, made to understand that they're absent, erased. Zohrot, the organization, marks Land Day, March the 30th, coming up, with demonstrations and maintains a website with historical information of the sort that you can't see, you can't read there. Um, a cultural resistance to colonial erasure. Now, the Dehesha refugee camp south of Bethlehem has about 13,000 inhabitants in about one and a half square kilometers. The Leilak Center is a grassroots organization that invests in the capacity of youth so they can help themselves and their community, combining activism and professionalism. Naji Ali founder and executive director, talked to us after supper on the roof terrace. There is only one paid member of staff, all the others are volunteers, and it's a strategy designed to resist NGO dependency, as well as the occupation. Any young person is welcome to come for support on any matter. And there is a lot of art all over the walls, all up the staircases, everywhere, it's great. Moving on, the Laji Center is located in Ida refugee camp on the edge of Bethlehem. This is where Nidal is from. Uh, serving a population of about 8,500 in Ida and Alaze camps. Ida camp, according to a 2018 report from the Human Rights Center at Berkeley, No Safe Space, found that, quote, the tear gas exposure was widespread, frequent, and indiscriminate, and that, quote, there were no safe places in the camp. The same report stated that Ida Camp suffered the most intense concentration of tear gas of any place in the world. In response to this situation <coughs> and the desperate circumstances in which young people found themselves, the Laji Center was founded in 2000 and has developed programs for community health, for water treatment to make it clean and portable, <coughs> for healthy diets and the development of roof gardens, all in an environment where there is food insufficiency and no open space at ground level. Based on a successful mu music program for various ages and a new playground, Laji is now in the process of developing a kindergarten for preschool children. The founder and director, Salah Jarma, is an unpaid volunteer, but the leader for each of the programs is paid a modest salary. Now, the last section on cultural resistance relates to street art. It's all pervasive, and as in revolutionary China, or in Paris in 1968, Israel's separation wall is the background for posters and paintings and graffiti that are public newspaper, library, and gallery all in one. What you see from the few samples shown here is that some are quasi-historical and documentary, recording children killed in the struggle, villages destroyed, and olive trees uprooted, and others 
are commemorative and laudatory of those engaged in the struggle, past and present. And with that, we transition into political resistance. Art is also the medium for commemoration and compassion. In our walk through the Heisha camp, we were invited into the home of Abu and Um Hassan, the parents of Martes, a young man who initiated a demonstration in protest at the approaching death of his imprisoned brother. Martes was shot and killed by an Israeli sniper. His parents talked of the great gap that had left in the, fa that had left in the family, clearly in evidence as we looked at the walls of the living room on which were hung mementos and images honoring and memorializing the slain son. Another brother, Hassan, came into the house as we were in discussion. He'd only recently been released from nine years administrative detention, meaning without trial, and was at first highly suspicious of a group of Americans in his parents' house. Palestinians, Palestinians are allergic to the word USA, he told us. Whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in charge, we have been suffering from their system from the beginning until today. He told us that over a million Palestinians have been in Israeli jails. Almost every family has a son or daughter in jail. The existential pain and anxiety was made especially clear as he told us that on his release, he was warned by the Shabak, the Israeli Shabak, that he would either be rearrested within two months or killed. His choice. In addition to the personal, family, and community anguish imposed by the oppression of the occupation, he also talked of the political situation. The existing political parties are weak and ineffectual. We also heard, here as elsewhere, that a dependency on NGOs had created a sort of moral rot from within the community. BDS was considered an important tactic, but no more than that. The only way forward, he says, is through international solidarity <coughs> with, for instance, black and indigenous peoples in the US and elsewhere, the intersectionality implied in mutual support. Individualism is breaking us, he said. We must get back to our collectivism. It will take sacrifices for the human to be free, but we want humanity to live. We then went to Nabi Saleh, north of Ramallah, so a little bit up the map, to talk with Bassem Tamimi, his daughter Ahed, and Lana Ramadan, a lawyer from the legal group Adamir. The village of Nabi Saleh is in Area C again, and has a population of only 500, all named Tamimi. They've been exercising non-violent Gandhian-style resistance to the occupation in general and to house demolitions in particular since 2009, when settlers backed by the army seized their water source. Four people have been killed since the start of their demonstrations and about 400 arrested. Another 400 have been injured, 40% of them children. Israeli snipers aim to shoot at the knee. Bassam has been arrested and jailed countless times. Ahed, his teenage daughter, you see on the right, described her own experience of being imprisoned, of the callous indifference of her jailers, of her great appreciation of the solidarity of women in jail, and of her renewed determination to become a lawyer and to make connections with other struggles. In response to a question from one of our African-American delegates, her message to black youth in the US was, stay strong, you must fight for all the oppressed, not just for Palestinian rights. And then Lana Ramadan, who is the second from the right in that picture, uh, she's the lawyer from Adamir uh, and represents about 6,000 Palestinians, many arrested and jailed for minor traffic violations many administratively detained, meaning held indefinitely without charges and without trial. Charges, arrests, and imprisonments are noted for their capriciousness, a tactic used to keep the population constantly on edge. You just simply don't know whether you're going to be arrested or not. You simply don't know whether your child is going to come back home or not. Her message was, it would be easy to despair, but think of our head and her example of strength. We lose people and others get demotivated but we don't have the option to abandon hope. Then the last visit to mention was to listen to Omar Baghouti talk about the current state of the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign of which he is co-founder. In his historical sweep, he talked of the parallels with the boycotting of South African economic products and international cultural and sporting events. And three major points he made were BDS is gaining a lot of traction with the democratic countries 
but none with authoritarian regimes. Netanyahu and Trump have managed to associate Israel and the Zionist project with some of the most abjectly right-wing regimes, e.g. Trump's America, Orban's Hungary, and Bolsonaro's Brazil. And then lastly, he said, the affinities between black and Native American movements in the US and the Palestinian struggle are strong and can be mutually beneficial in their respective campaigns. Now, this has you know, necessarily been a very short presentation on the number of places we visited and the people we met and the issues we were introduced to and discussed. But here is a collage of some, some of those who I've mentioned, but many of those who we didn't have time to talk about. We met farmers and teachers and students and trade unionists and grandmothers and lawyers, a doctor, community health workers, conscientious objectors, LGBTQT activists and others. We met Palestinians and Israelis resisting the occupation by fighting for land rights, water rights, rights to food, demanding freedom of movement, freedom from arrest, freedom to live, freedom from occupation. And the question you have to ask is, why do these people tolerate talking to Americans when it's the United States that is the supporter and enabler of Israel in their oppression? Time and again, we found that Palestinians can readily distinguish regular Americans, including Jewish Americans, from their government. Quite apart from the human contact, they see it as worthwhile to invest in talking, in representing their case, relying on our ability to represent their case to our neighbors and colleagues and elected representatives, i.e. you. As Omar Barghouti and others repeatedly point out, all they're asking for is that Palestinians should enjoy freedom, justice, and equal rights, just like anyone else. So I will not have a ton of slides, um, <laughs> and I'll just um, speak a little bit from my own experience, um, particularly as a black woman and as um, a person who does work around uh, ecological justice. So um, this was not my first trip. Um, I um, went in 2015, and I wanted to, the reason that I'll start is that I grew up um, and I went to school uh, like half mile from here at the Windsor School, it was an all girls school. Um, and a good percentage of my school was uh, Jewish, com and we were right down the street from Temple Israel, and so I've grown up with um, deep relationships and connections to the Jewish community. And I remember um, when Yitzhak Rabin was, was killed, there were one of the students at my school was speaking about it, and another student that I also knew called her a Zionist. The two of them got into a deep argument, and I was like, I don't know what's going on here? Um, and so I started to learn a little bit more um, about Israel, about Israeli history, um, about the formation of the State of Israel. And, um, and then I also remember um, I worked a lot in hip hop um, culture and working with young people around hip hop. And remember hearing from a lot of Palestinian hip hop artists um, who were describing conditions um, that I was familiar with, um, and then also um, uh, conditions that were even worse than um, what I was used to in terms of issues with the police and um, issues with folks just trying to survive and, and, and live doing the basic things that human beings need to do. And so 2015, I had the opportunity, I was a student at the um, School of Theology, and there was a trip called Dual Narratives, and I had been offered opportunities before that, um, but I really wanted to take a trip that allowed me to really look at um, both perspectives on how, you know, how people saw what was going on, um, and a real try to, like, attempt to understand, like, what, what's at the foundation of this? Um, and so we read a book that's, you know, I recommend if you want to, it's called Side by Side, and it's, ha the book is written by uh, Jewish history, or Israeli history teachers who are all Jewish in this particular instance, and um, Palestinian history teachers. And you, they, when they say side by side, it's literally side by side, like, so one page is one narrative, then the other page is the other narrative. You can't read it across. You have to just kind of read a whole chapter and then go back and read the whole other chapter. But, um, and so it was really powerful for me because as a person who comes from um, an oppressed group, I have this deep question about like how can a group that 
has been so deeply oppressed also participate in the oppression of another group? And um, that was really the question I needed to grapple with. Um, and I would say um, that first trip in 2015, and I went to a lot of the um, places that we um, visited, uh, but also some that we didn't. Um, and I um, was heartbroken, heartbroken. I remember one particular experience, um, and I, I would say the first thing I would say is that I, I deeply understood the Jewish desire for a homeland. So I just want to be really clear as a person, uh, as an oppressed person who lives in a country where you're not always sure whether the nation that you've spent your whole life in will have your back when the rubber meets the roll. I understand what it is to want a place where you know that the people there will, where your life will matter. Where if, it, if, if it all goes wrong, you have some place to go. I get it. And so the question was, a homeland, but at what price? And I remember one of the incidents that I think most, um, I, I remember is, you know, I'm a knitter. I would have been knitting um, if I wasn't, you know, making sure that I was reviewing my notes. Um, and I was on the, on the bus and I was knitting the whole time and the color happened to be green. That was just because it was. I mean, it wasn't like a statement to knit something green. Um, but I remember feeling like I had to hide that because we'd go, we'd get to these stops and they'd get on the bus um, and it, it was often young people serving in, um, you know, their obligatory middle military service, but coming on with these like huge automatic. You know, it's growing up in a community um, and running an organization in a community where guns have taken the lives of people that I love. <laughs> um, I remember just feeling, you know, sort of what does it mean to, to have your young people walking around with like Uzis hanging from, from their necks? And so I remember this young person got on and it was an uh, Israeli of color and so everybody's like pulling out their passport and um, as I got off, you know, I just sort of said to myself, because they were checking because, you know, the highways are separated. This is less the, less the case now because it's just so much less freedom of movement for Palestinians that the highways are, are actually less regulated than they used to be. Um, but I had this moment when, it said, when I said to myself, how can I, as a black woman, be sitting on a segregated highway built by survivors of the Holocaust? And it just felt so wrong. <laughs> and so I um, came back, um, and I remember I had to write my final paper, and I like couldn't get myself to write it. And finally, I literally, I was like, I have to graduate. I <laughs> have to finish this paper. And I literally cried my way through most of the writing. Um, and I think it, it came at that point that I, um, I've struggled around nationalism as an idea. Um, even within my own context in terms of black nationalism. And I um, feel like that first trip was when I came to the clear conclusion that um, nationalism as an ideology is bankrupt no matter what epithet you put before it. And so Zionism, which is just Jewish nationalism, is not something I can support. I just can't support it. And so that, that trip was you know, really challenging. So when I got another offer, I was like, I don't know if I want to go through that again emotionally. Um, but part of the reason I went is because um, this trip focused on the water crisis, um, which is something as um, a person who works on ecology um, has has been uh, moving in my life like it just feels like it keeps bringing, the spirit keeps bringing it up in different sets of settings. Um, I was out in Standing Rock in 2016 um, and really identified with the notion of, as, of water as, the, as life. There, I say this to my congregation all the time when we joke about it, like I carry in my bag almost always a water bottle and my phone. But our tendency is, if you forget your water bottle, you go, Okay, you know, I'll find something somewhere else. But if you, forget it, if you forget your phone, I don't know about you, I will go back home to get my phone. 
And this recognition that we as a society have come to a place where we have lost touch with what really matters. Because if I don't have my phone, it feels like I won't make it, but the truth is that I, I will keep breathing and I will <laughs> keep living. But if I don't have water, even for three days, I may die. And so this question of at what price came up again on this trip. You know, the water crisis is very real, not just in Israel. The water crisis is real in Syria. The water crisis is real in Southern Africa. The water crisis is real in Flint, Michigan, which is where I, I was visiting with a pastor a friend there and preaching there last summer. And so I think um, we kept hearing about water, about the role that water was playing, about the lack of water and how it was causing people to have to leave. Um, I spent some time having some conversations with Palestinian Christians, many of whom have left at this point because they do have a slightly easier time getting visas and life has gotten so bad. Um, and sort of the irony of seeing all these Christian pilgrims like walking around with no context for what they were seeing. Um, and so you're like at the, the um, you're at Bethlehem Square and you're taking pictures and behind you there's a settlement which people don't even know is a settlement. Um, people have no context in Jerusalem. Uh, and that was really challenging for me um, because <laughs> Uh, even when I entered, I, you know, I was like, I'm here, I'm, I'm Christian. I wore my, like, you know, I was in my full, like, clergy gear. And they were like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, great, so glad um, you're here. Um, but, you know, this, this question of the larger context of what we're facing. And for me, this crisis is not just about Israel and Palestine, but it has been demonstrated in such a powerful way. And I think the place I um, was most impacted was in Jericho because I know that Jericho is one of those like early, early places that human beings settled. The belief is that people have been in Jericho as long as 8,000 years. And the reason that they came was because water was so plentiful there. That our ancestors have known that water is the source of life long before we you know, had MacBooks and a lot of other things that have made us lose our sense of context. And so as we went to the spring that you would see, it literally, I, I Googled it to see what it had looked like before and it just looked majestic. And it was almost impossible to believe that what I was seeing on this picture was where I was standing. And then I remember hearing about um, Israel's plan for the Jordan River the plan to just, dis to just move all this water to, to um, you know, what do they call it, um, redirect. It's like how do you redirect an entire river? And I had had the opportunity to swim in the Dead Sea, which is more accurately called the Dead Pond at this point. And I had this moment of like, what hubris allows you to believe. So for me, from a God perspective, that if God made it this way thousands, millions of years ago, you have the right to just send it in another direction because that's better for your development plans. And that hubris is not just in Israel. I deal with that hubris every day in the United States and all around the world. But it feels like they are reaching such a crisis point. For those of you, us who know anything about aquifers, they don't replenish quickly. It's not like if you just take them out and you get a couple good years of rain, the aquifer replenishes. It takes thousands of years for water to get to that aquifer. And the idea that you could just strip it away so quickly and it's all going to work out, it just seemed absolutely ludicrous to me. And so I, I look at in my life and in my work, what we as human beings need to do to turn away from the way that we're living into a way that is ultimately sustainable. And what you see in Israel and Palestine is one of the most accelerated versions of the deep connection between ecological devastation, human suffering, and just 
sheer human greed and, and folly. <laughs> this literally can't work. You cannot box people more and more and more in and think they won't resist. There's something about the human spirit you cannot quench no matter how many development plans you put together. So I know we're going to have time for questions, and I know we're a little behind them. The one other story that I wanted to share was um, going to Hebron, which I had been to in 2015. Um, it was probably the worst or most you know, sort of emotionally challenging part of the trip in 2015. And then I went back and found that it was even worse um, the second time. When we had gone before, we were able to visit um, with a woman whose um, house was in order, you know, in order to sort of prevent violence and for security reasons, whole sections of Palestinian communities have been shut down so that you can create a, a like a corridor of, 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 of um, access to the synagogue. Um, when the synagogue is one part of um, what was 100% a mosque is now, you know, split. I can't remember what the percentage is of who has what, but. Um, it's split, and we met with a woman who had owned a, a, a space on, on that street that had been shut down, and she talked about how it used to be a great shop space because when everybody got out of prayers on Friday, they all had to walk past you, and you'd see people, and you'd sort of wave, and, and so she had been shut down. And when we got there, it was, you know, sort of just board, you know, boarded up or, or closed, and people had grades that were coming down. When we got there, uh, this past year, those same spaces had been occupied by settlers who had sort of like put banners over the houses or over the shops and sort of taken over them. And then there were military people there to like, you know, protect them for having taken this land. Um, and where I think my heart was most deeply broken um, in Hebron was, so we went around, we saw the shops, we talked to people, we saw the sort of bottles of pee that were thrown over by the settlers. Um, it, I mean, you can see them. <laughs> They're still there sometimes. They don't all pour onto people. Um, and so you can sort of see them hanging there. Um, and and uh, as we went deeper in, we saw more and more places that had been shut down, some places that had been opened when I had been there the last time and are no longer open at this point. And uh, it was, it was um, you know, October, November, and um, I knew that we had just passed um, the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, um, which I have tended to participate in because it's a holiday where you um, celebrate the harvest and you celebrate nature and you create a structure that you sit outside under branches and have dinner and, and are sort of in community with folks. So, so all these places have been shut down and one of the ways to make sure they stayed shut down was to throw trash into the alleys because if you put the trash there, nobody's going to come by to shop. And when I looked down, <laughs> I saw tons and tons of, of branches, the kind that I know of you put over the school houses. And I said, when did these come? He said, eh, like late September. And I said, oh God, how could you celebrate a time that's about the harvest, about God's provision, and then use those branches <laughs> to clutter the street of another group of folks. And so the role of religion, the role of, you know, sort of this sense that God has given me X and therefore has dis dispossessed you of Y, and for me, part of that is, although as a black Christian, I was not really deeply, my particular ancestors were not deeply engaged in it, but the whole recognition that Christianity did that to Jewish people, <laughs> who then turned around and did that to Muslim people, and sort of how this cycle of, of oppression in the name of God continues in such terrible ways. So those were my experiences, the things that you know, sort of really uh, stood out to me. And I know that we're going to engage in some, 
um, dialogue, so I'll stop there and uh, participate in the conversation. Thank you.